it's really a pleasure for me to be here today and to get to give this talk, to write this talk exactly to a series on the self, something that I care passionately about and have for a long time. And yes, the title is, Could You Direct Me to the Individuology Department? And thank you to Yuval Avnur for inviting me to talk about something I care about deeply. So it must be clear what my message will be. I used this ironic title. Can you direct me to the individuology department? Perfectly innocuous question, but I'm very serious about it. And of course, the answer is you can't. There isn't one. There's no academic department or field in which the main focus is the individual and individual subjectivity. No field that asks how to conceptualize the individual and the nature and constitution of individuality and selfhood. No field that theorizes or is organized to study empirically the components of individuality. No field that asks how individuality and individual subjectivity develop and change. In what follows, what I'm going to do is suggest that I'm going to read a paper. I'm a very different kind of lecture from our wonderful, wonderful previous speaker. Uh, I suggest that the absence of individuology in the academy, the absence of a direct way to study individual lives, is a great lacuna, a missing piece in our conception of what should be studied, known about, and taught, and in our conception of academic knowledge. Just as we want to understand societies in all their fullness, polities in all their fullness, economic <coughs> processes, moral reasoning, ethics, conceptions of justice, and so forth, we need a field that directs its attention to the individual human being, to theory, methodologies, and epistemologies for understanding how each person constructs and experiences herself. I'll describe my own route to these conclusions. I suggest, and I'll elaborate, that psychoanalysis provides our most comprehensive theory of individuality and of the experience of self, as well as our most elaborated account of how to study individuals. It may not be the only theory of individuality that we have, but it is, I believe, the only field or the major field that theorizes individuality, that focuses centrally and exclusively on what constitutes individuality, and that studies individuals in all their complexity. Psychoanalysis would be a basis of individuology, but I would hope that the field would expand, attract already existing cognate areas, and enable the development of new ones. I'll spend some time describing psychoanalytic study uh, understandings of individuality and selfhood. Finally, I will describe how we might bring this study to the university. Within the university, or the college, or the academy as it's currently organized, a department whose subject matter was the study of individuals and the theorizing of individuality would most appropriately be located within the social sciences. Individuology would provide complementary understandings of social life and of human life, of human life to those that we now find within sociology, anthropology, political science, and economics. Further, individuology potentially shares epistemological and methodological terrain with the qualitative social sciences. It is among these fields that we find those qualitative, interactive, and intersubjective methodologies that are also appropriate, as psychoanalysis suggests, to the study of individuals. I'll address some of the challenges to this study and some of my curricular attempts to meet these challenges. I'm advocating, of course, you know from the introduction and anything you've ever read of mine, for my own intellectual focus and passion, and I'm describing my own intellectual history. I began in the social sciences during a time when interdisciplinarity was really pervasive and, and where some social science departments incorporated sociology, anthropology, social and personality psychology, and sometimes psychoanalytic theory. 
and I'm partisan. Looking back, I can see that my intellectual passion throughout has been the individual, individual in all his or her complexity, how individuals create their lives. As an undergraduate anthropologist, I studied how people in different cultures develop and experience themselves. In graduate school, I asked how women become who we are. I wondered why we have feelings about ourselves as gendered and sexual beings and how our gendering helps shape our very sense of being in the world. For feminists, the personal was political, but I somehow knew that you could not just ask. What mattered to gendered selfhood were ways of being and relating that were not conscious, but vaguely felt. And I found psychoanalysis that field that describes, as I put it in the title of one of my books, the power of feelings, people's creation of their individuality and personal meaning. Just as other branches of psychology tell us about innate structures of language or cognitive capacities, so also psychoanalysis suggests that part of our innate psychic makeup is that we infuse experience with unconscious meaning. We locate ourselves in relation to others, originally to family and parents. We bring emotional orientations, fear, shame, guilt, general wariness, suspiciousness or anger, sometimes at ourselves, sometimes at others, to experience. What for one person seems an innocuous or even positive encounter may for another feel fraught, threatening, or charged with anger, with inappropriate <clears throat> seduction, with mockery. Individuals then create our subjective lives. We draw upon internally, internal biologically given capacities for unconscious and conscious meaning making. We draw upon our temperament, our developmental experiences in particular families, our fantasies and wishes from within, all of these in the context that we live basically an emotional life, an affective life. Psychoanalysis describes how people draw upon these innate capacities for unconscious and conscious meaning making. Each person has her own pattern of defensive choices. One may deny what she experiences. My friend just didn't see me. She didn't purposely snub me. Another turns anger or aggression inward, becomes depressed and self-blaming for what has happened to him. I shouldn't have been walking there. I don't belong in this country. Another turns passive to active, aggressing against someone felt to be weak in a way that she herself felt weak. I'll take out my rage against that person on my spouse, my children, my younger sibling instead of against that person who harmed me and hurt me, but I feel too scared to fight back against them. We know something about these patterns of experiencing and how they develop. Inborn psychobiological propensities of personality, temperament, and character contribute. Family experience looms large, as I'm sure you all know. Was a parent hovering and anxious? quick to anger or seriously abusive? Was her or his temperament attuned more to that of one child than another? What happened to parental rage and fear, whether at the parents' parents or at the world at large? Some translate the reactions of fear and rage to their children and others do not. It makes a huge difference how we are treated how those taking care of a child are faring in the world and at home, and an even huger difference how they are faring internally and emotionally. Social and historical location, culture, class, ethnicity, gender, these all affect internal life. Yet how someone reacts to these external challenges is not predictable, or it is predictable statistically but not individually. At its core, psychoanalysis makes the person's selfhood or subjectivity front and central. And its theory is directed to the understanding of subjectivity in detail. 
In each case of parent, of child, each of us, it's not only what comes from without, but what comes from within, within and what is created from within. I myself found psychoanalysis serendipitously. I read by happenstance during the summer after my freshman year a now almost unknown book, Childhood and Society, published in 1950 by a now almost unknown author, Eric Erickson, who was in the 1950s and the 1960s a major public intellectual. Erickson was a psychoanalyst, a follower of Freud and Anna Freud, who more or less introduced the ideas of identity and psychobiography to the clinical and intellectual world. We now talk about identity all over the place, but Erickson was really the one who first used the term and who talked about how identity fragments get put together and the different components of identity that we bring in, trying to create a wholeness about it. And later, when I became interested in women, it also seemed that the only way to understand women, as I said, as we are, as we felt, as we thought about ourselves, was through psychoanalysis. So both in this early period of just discovering Erickson and reading this book that seemed to speak to me, and then later when I was part of a movement trying to understand women, psychoanalysis seemed to give us something about understanding the self that nothing else at that point gave. Eventually I came to study mothers and daughters, which I don't have to tell most of you, gets you right to the heart of the personal and the emotional. At the time, the mother-daughter relationship was unnoticed among the four basic parent-child dyads. You could find a lot about father-daughter, father-son, mother-son, and there was really nothing about mother-daughter. So in the reproduction of mothering, which was, you've all said was my first book, my dissertation, I suggested that mothers are likely to see their daughters from birth as more like, as extensions or replications of themselves, and sons more as other. This influences the basic development of self in a girl, what I called a female self in relation, in contrast to a male self that differentiates itself more from the other. Later, the supposedly Oedipal girl who wants her father oscillates, wanting father and mother. Later, and then she's attached to mother and misses her, wants girlfriends later as well as a boyfriend. I also suggested that same-sex cross-generation, mother-daughter, father-son, was of equal importance to gender as male-female. Now, I'm not going to go on about this because I'm going on to other things, but you just have to bear with me that I know in the, cur in the current period of sexualities and sexual politics, um, all of the fields in the era when I was first doing this work, sociology, family study, anthropology, psychoanalysis, psychology, were all what we would call heterosexist. Um, so you just have to use your imagination here, because that would be a whole other five talks. Um, to think of different ethnicities, different racial ethnic family patterns. Um, and just the thing, the takeaway is not exactly what the patterns of attachment are, but that no one grows up without unconscious passions and senses of self. I know now that as a clinician that every mother-daughter pair is unique, but you can also see commonalities, patterns of family resemblances that I somehow uncannily managed to describe with some accuracy quite a long time ago. Briefly, mothers and daughters are entangled with one another. Many daughters yearn for closeness to their mothers. Many mothers feel closely identified and over-identified with their daughters. There's a lot of bi-directional mother-daughter guilt. Mothers experience daughters as, in some sense, like them, and these daughters reciprocate, creating a self in relationship. Sons, by contrast, try to differentiate and separate themselves. So that, as a generalization, you can say that boys and men form their sense of masculinity and selfhood partly through a defensive denial of connection. Now, these were all generalizations, but they were also right. You can see this in everyday clinical experience when daughters from mother-father families describe memories of father working late or not being home, 
nestling in the kitchen with mother and supper was chicken noodle soup or grilled cheese or scrambled eggs and toast or whatever counted as comfort food in that particular family. I also suggested that women sh a woman shapes her maternal identity, desire, and feelings through her internal and external relationship to her mother, her sense of her mother's maternal body and her own body, maternal communications about mothering, and so forth. When you find a woman who has sort of wanted children, I've written about this and, and a lot from my own clinical work, but has sort of put it off or really put it off or had destroyed her fertility through many abortions, you're likely to discover in a woman who has put off motherhood till it's too late or has made it impossible for herself to be a mother, if she's concerned about it, that there's an unconscious internal fantasy of a deadened or destroyed maternal womb, perhaps a sense that her own uterus is also dead, or that the woman herself did this to herself. And you may also find an unconscious sense of time passing, a denial of time passing, time stands still. So what I learned actually through thinking about these women who wanted to have children when it was too late was that gender-related fantasies and gender-related outcomes don't always center on something we'd call psychological gender. For women who put off motherhood and for men who can't move for forward because of internal barriers, they have different ways of conceptualizing time. Time may stand still, it runs backward, it repeats cyclically, you find repeated images of the same family photos, people who are always late, people who make three appointments at the same time, different ways of denying that time moves forward. And in an extreme case that I'm talking about, you find a kind of a deadened ability to move on. And in the case of, of fertility, it, it has a, a final a biological consequence. I became a psychoanalyst so I could understand these processes from inside and on the ground, specifically to understand gendered selfhood and subjective gender. In contrast to the social sciences, which is where I was located as a sociologist and originally in anthropology, psychoanalysis documents an irreducible realm of psychological life in which we create personal meaning. It affirms individual subjectivity and selfhood the insistent, relentless uniqueness of each person, the fact that each person directly, actively creates his or her psychic reality. And it firms this against the generalizing and abstracting tendencies and the social and cultural determinism of the social sciences. I don't know if, I mean, from hearing who was at the last, I don't know if there are any, I've met, talked to one person, I don't know if there are any social science, scientists in the room here. But this is a lot whom I'm talking to and about, so. I'm too embarrassed to admit it. No, just, I am a social scientist. A theory of the active creation of an unconscious inner world and sense of self. Psychoanalysis helps us to elucidate the intertwining of the sociocultural with psychobiological gender and sexuality. To substantiate the view that gender is neither biologically determined nor a social and cultural imposition, but a psychic creation. We can expand this observation. Any experience of racial, ethnic, or personal identity, our relationships, our work, mountain climbing or meditation, <coughs> any experience that matters is psychically infect, inflected, has emotional casting, and unconscious as well as conscious meaning. Feelings with stories and stories with feelings. We filter and give personal meaning to everything. Our social and historical location, our place in culture, in class and ethnicity, our gender and sexuality. This is our selfhood. My premise as a psychoanalyst and a psychoanalytic sociologist is that selfhood, subjectivity, is not created from without. It is not created by those political and structural conditions or discursive tropes that we find described in, throughout a lot of the contemporary humanities, nor by the experiences of race, class, ethnicity, culture, and gender, 
that sociology, women's studies, and ethnic studies describe. Psychoanalysis shows how meaning is created from within by innate capacities bringing unconscious feelings and fantasies to observed and experienced external realities. I suggested for those of you in the seminar that you read a couple of chapters of The Power of Feelings. As I put it there, transference is the hypothesis and demonstration that our inner world of psychic reality helps to shape, create, and give meaning to the intersubjective social and cultural worlds that we inhabit. I notice that many everyday experiences, in the clinical setting, for example, therapist or patient being late, a new picture in the office, a patient's reluctance to give her therapist his new address, to give his therapist his new address, all of these can be in the unconscious through transference and personal meaning, grand passions. For the clinician and for individuology, it's really important to keep in mind both patterns, what do we know in general about individuals, and individuality, a person's individual uniqueness. You can't think psychologically without some general sense of how human beings construct themselves, what might go wrong, what happens with trauma, maltreatment, tragic accident, as well as with the slings and arrows of ordinary life. But you can't think psychologically unless you believe firmly and deeply that none of these experiences causes a particular reaction. People shape and create their psychic lives from within. To understand what it is to be a particular woman, a particular mother-daughter pair, you need psychoanalytically informed, individualizing modes of inquiry. I became a psychoanalyst. What did I learn? I learned to listen and focus on the immediate here and now of transference, that is, of unspoken but sensed emotional communications from patients to me, and counter-transference, my own feelings that I learned to observe and to begin to interpret. Especially, I learned to listen to affect. At the same time, because I was a theorist and a social scientist, I found myself continually interested in psychoanalysis as a grand theory, what I came to call psychoanalytic visions of subjectivity. Visions, such visions of images of emotional possibility, of the character of fantasy and mind, in our terms today, of selfhood. These visions underlie most psychoanalytic theories and conceptions of process what is happening and what is desired in therapy and in life. Psychoanalytic visions of subjectivity, and I suggested, um, I recommended my last chapter with that title, are always in the back of my mind and I think of many clinicians' minds as we work. They would also provide one foundation of individuology, forthright claims about what makes a meaningful life, meaningful selfhood. These visions stand out against postmodernist skepticism about humanist universalizing, against the more cognitive and brain interests of contemporary psychology, and against the social determinism of the social sciences that says that mind comes from social experience and location. I want to describe for you some of these conceptions, these goals that Freud first formulated about expanding and deepening understanding and awareness and feeling. Freud says that he wants to help, some of them are very ordinary, he wants to help patients to be able to love and work, to replace neurotic misery with ordinary human unhappiness. <laughs> he says where it was, where it was, it's the it, that inchoate, non-focused part of the psyche, psyche that we seem to have no control over, there the I shall become. He wants to help individuals make their unconscious thoughts conscious. Other analysts focus on self and other, connection and separation, relatedness and individuation. I've written about Hans Lowell, my kind of favorite analyst, who says, the deepest root of the ambivalence that appears to pervade all relationships, external as well as internal, seems to be the polarity inherent in individual existence of individuation, individuality, and primary narcissistic union, primary oneness. 
Lowell is telling us that to be human, to be human, is to be concerned in an ongoing way with how to move between being a separate being, a separate self, and being connected to and one with others. Another analyst tells us, the harmonious interpenetrating mix-up between the individual and the most important parts of his environment, his love objects, is the desire of all humanity. Another describes man's eternal struggle against both fusion and isolation. They're giving us these big stories. What's the meaning of life? Psychoanalysis is focusing then on individuality, personal meaning, in psychoanalytic terms, fantasy and transference. How do we experience ourselves in relation to the other? How do we create the experiential immediacy of the present? How do we create it psychologically? Personal meaning involves the creation of our ego, our I, and our experience and delineation of reality out there from the point of view of the subject. If something is important to us, it's important to us because we bring meaning from within. Here's a small personal example of my own emotional and transferential selfhood. I love the mountains while others love the ocean. Now I can begin to understand this. I was a small child transplanted from east to west when I was three. My homesick mother's six brothers and sisters remained 3,000 miles away. My mother later reported, or she said, she apparently said at the time, but I was only like three or four, but she told me later that she had first felt at home when we visited Yosemite. I moved to Northern California at the age of three. But it's more innate, as yet unknown. It's also for me, I don't think it's just transference from the past. It's something about the air, about the clear blue sky, about those massive granite formations that move me in a way that waves crashing on sand move other people. I, and I like that, but my soul doesn't soar in quite the same way. I'm transferring something. I'm bringing something from my unconscious to my conscious, even more than from past to present, and from myself to my surround in my response to Yosemite or the Swiss Alps. I'm creating the external world through transference. We can bring such insights also to the intersubjective realm, the relations between our inner and outer relational world. Why, if you are straight, do only some people of the other gender attract you and not others? And if you're gay, similarly. We live in an inner world, bring from early childhood internal templates of passion, fear, body, smell, tone of voice, all complexly affecting our adult attractions, including, as we all know, I think everybody in this room must know, our capacity to get involved over and over with the same kind of wrong person. <laughs> Finally, and not negligibly, while we are in the realm of individuality and selfhood, psychoanalysis describes fundamental senses of psychic aliveness and psychic deadness. Someone very much biologically alive can nonetheless be psychically dead without the capacity to dream, create, or play, without an inner sense of vibrancy or agency, without a cohesive or con continuous internal self. Psychoanalysts talk about and talk to patients who are, we could say, not alive in spite of their bodily ability to walk into the consulting room. And we all have moments, ho hopefully not more than moments, of feeling not alive. For the clinician, the goal is to find the impediments to being alive and to find the particular forms of deadness in a particular individual. For my imagined individuology researcher, the goal is to theorize further this aliveness, what it consists in to be psychically alive, and to think about how we might study it. Even as we can look at the components of self, how people construct a self, what it is to be an individual or to have a self, or as we often find in the consulting room, not to feel like an individual or not to have a cohesive or coherent self or continuous self. All of these visions that I'm talking about, these visions of personal meaning, begin with emotions. 
And that was why I called my book The Power of Feelings. Our emotions are not raw psychobiological affects, but always feelings with stories about self, body, other's body, self with other, and so forth. Our internal stories actually create us as selves. Analytic writers conceptualize anxiety and depression, envy and gratitude, lust and desire, love and hate, hope and dread, psychic aliveness and psychic deadness. And any experience of anxiety, of depression, desire, envy, love or hate has its own unconscious story, stories that are passionate and have dire consequences. Different formulations describe destroying the self or the other, patricide and matricide, atoning for or repairing the results of one's destructiveness, merging with or invading another, feeling dead with a dead other or dead with an alive other who's taken all one's aliveness. They may involve an unrealistic holding out for an unattainable goal or a belief that a particular relationship will solve all problems forever. Fantasies, these are all fantasies, shape our internal life and are brought through transference to interpersonal relationships, to work, and to our experience of the social and cultural world. We transfer these internal pictures to the external world. I'm describing a subjectivist vision, which for me is central to self and selfhood. We create our experience of the world through our personal emotional and transferential lens. <clears throat> From the point of view of the self, inner and outer are not given for all time qualities in any direct empirical sense. Both external and internal have emotional and physical perceptual meaning. Transference, as must be clear, would be for me a key theoretical term in individuology. We bring internal meanings to the external world, including ourselves, and unconscious meanings to the conscious shaping and coloring of experience. Dreaming, we transfer unconscious, unformulated experience to consciousness. So that one of, Freud talks about one of the things that dreams do is that some inchoate, non-thought thought can be hooked onto a day residue, hooked onto something that's more conscious, and then it can be elaborated in the dreaming process. And that's another kind of transference of, these, of this sort of not thought known, this something way back there that gets hooked onto the story or hooked onto something that happened during the day that allows the dream to develop. Our transferences, and those of you who have read psychoanalysis may know this, may, may limit or drag us down or they may negatively shape experience because we can bring old patterns of interaction to new relationships or see others through a lens that belongs to an earlier time in our lives. And such negative shaping is what brings people to treatment and what we often address clinically. But without transference and fantasy, without those very processes of unconscious emotional attribution and shaping, there would be no personal meaning and no individual selfhood. When I describe myself, when I describe transference to patients, or when I describe it in my teaching, and when I described it in my teaching, because I taught a lot of people of the age of some of you in this room, the undergraduates that I taught for 30 years, um, I mean something conventional. We transfer our early feelings and our early relational modes, especially with parents and family, to later relationships. That's a, one of the meanings of transference from past to present. You find yourself, as I said, repeatedly in the same relational snarl with the same lover or with different lovers or with, di or with different friends. But I also mean unconscious templates that give meaning to the world we live in. There's me and my mountains. So that the capacity for transference is really one of the great human capacities and one of the foundations of a meaningful life. Early in treatment, when I'm working with someone, I want to convey to them that everything has psychic meaning. I want my patients to know that we will discover unconscious meanings, fantasies, wishes, transferences from unconscious to conscious or past to present in everyday interactions and in what they say and do. And that 
Finding this transference does, does not automatically make it pathological or something to be gotten over. I say we'll be finding meaning, not fault. For patients, for students, for colleagues, and for myself, I've actually found it helpful to redescribe transference as a filter or a prism. There's nothing wrong with transference. If you didn't have these transferential filters or prisms, these unconscious templates in you, you wouldn't have a meaningful life. It's what makes your life meaningful. Why am I so passionate about this? I don't know all the answers, but there's something transferential that gives me passion to talk about theory and thought and psychoanalysis and gives other people passion to talk about selfies or the history of self-portrait. Um, and we, we may or may not, not know something about this, but it's something from within. You wouldn't have that passion for selfies or psychoanalysis or for literature while economics left you cold or for physics while literature was only of passing interest. You wouldn't love Dickens and be indifferent to Trollope. Uh, though, actually, in my transferential book, not loving Austin is a sign of serious psychopathology. <laughs> but, um, it may or may not be essential for you to know why you have these particular passions, as it is for someone who goes into therapy because of their passions, or their lack of passion, or their life that feels meaningless. I'm suggesting, however, that in the university we should be interested in such questions. In philosophy, as I understand it, I'm on very thin ground here, we theorize about how minds work. We create suppositional problems and situations. In cognitive psychology, we may now scan brains. In both, we're considering emotions and feelings. I think that not only a finer-tuned moral philosophy and better cognitive psychology research, but also an intersubjective individuology that investigates each and every one of us as complex subjects, each with a developmental history that informs our subjectivity, with a created conscious and unconscious sense of self, and with particular emotions and personality, with particular defenses, all of this would better help us to understand our minds beyond the brain scans, beyond the suppositional problems. Why would we not study this? Individuology would of necessity focus not only on personal meaning and self-knowledge, but also on recognition, the intersubjective process through which we learn about self and other. We find this domain of recognition and self-recognition in qualitative sociology, in anthropology, in life history, and I'm sure elsewhere. In psychoanalysis, we talk about making the unconscious conscious as a first form of recognition recognizing and knowing elements of oneself that were heretofore, heretofore unknown. Recognition comes through self-reflection and from the other. One analytic writer talks, Krista Rabolis calls something the unthought known. The unthought known is a basic, a person's basic way of being and relating, but arises so early that it is not in any way cognized or conscious. It comes to be known with the help of the therapist who feels some kind of pressure to play a part in his patient's psychic drama. He senses feelings that complement or reproduce those coming from the patient, a deadness in the room, an excitement, a great sadness or sleepiness. He's feeling, the, the therapist is feeling what we call countertransference, feelings that seem to be evoked by this particular patient. And eventually, hopefully, patient and therapist together can name this pressure and this pattern. Countertransference helps the therapist and then the patient to articulate, to name what may be coming from the patient, pressures to soothe or be angry or be the object of anger, feelings of dependence and fear. Part of why therapists and analysts have their own treatment is so that they can know themselves, so that they can hopefully begin to sort out what strong feelings arise in them from their own past and their own individuality and when feelings are arising from the patient. So theorizing and studying recognition, in my view, would be central to individuology. Erickson actually gives us an idea of ego integrity. He calls it, it revolves around 
self-recognition. It's a step beyond being recognized by the other. Self-knowledge and self-agency, again, as part of selfhood or subjectivity. Throughout, Erickson has an inter, sort of an intersubjective developmental theory. He is first he has trust versus mistrust with the baby, and later identity is both something that's internal and also recognition by the other. But what he says is at the end of life and throughout life, um, ego integrity, recognition has to come from within. It involves, as he puts it, the acceptance of one's one and only life cycle as something that had to be and that by necessity permitted no substitutions. So Erickson is making a very difficult to accept point about individuality and selfhood. This is an individual life, individual life, selfhood, is your life and selfhood, however much you wish it had been something else. So a major domain of selfhood, therefore, is the extent to which the self feels that everything comes from without and is imposed, or that self is subjectively created, subjectively creating even awful experiences, but that coming to see that the way in which you experience them yourself. The social sciences in general, which I know most about, gender studies, ethnic studies, post-structural, post-modern theories, all of these see selfhood and individuality as coming from without. Whereas psychoanalysis and particularly formulations like regret resolution, ego integrity, taking impingement into the self and making it the selfs, all say that finally the self is experiencing these things and what you need to understand is how that experiencing has happened. Erickson says an individual life is the accidental coincidence of a one life cycle with one segment of history. However painful and difficult life has been, because of external economic, historical circumstances, political forces, racism, war. 90% of the analysts of a certain generation had to leave Europe because of Nazism, um, and they were very lucky to get out. All ego integrity requires recognizing, somehow internalizing and making one's own the recognition function, making this intersubjective recognition into a self-process for who you are and who you've been. Regret resolution. Now, of course, no one is making such claims because they're unaware of these impingements um, on a person's existence. As I said, um, most of the analysts of a particular generation had to leave Europe and, and were victims of Nazism. What ego integrity regret resolution suggests is that individuality, selfhood, benefit to the extent that one acknowledges experience. To what extent is an individual an experiencing agent who cannot intervene in or alter the past, the external past, but who's capable of intervening in and altering the experience and understanding of this past? You're born into a particular family, gender, ethnicity, body, but your subjective experience of self regarding this matter, these matters, let alone matters that you yourself have chosen or mischosen, can vary. One of my patients once said, I can't redo my childhood, the things that happened, the choices I made. I can't undo my age, my choices, but I can grieve instead of blaming others or being stuck on my childhood. So self-recognition, I would suggest, in my this form of individ is a form of individuation, of becoming a self, and would be part of my individuology, studying this. It ties not only to personal or biological history, experiencing oneself as an agent, but also recognizing what now can never be. This may be something very absolute. I said, as I said, I've written about women who come into treatment and are painfully recognizing in their 40s that they're never going to have children, or in their 50s. Even if by now they've resolved the conflicts that kept them from having children in a time when they could have had children, they're biologically simply too, too late. It also might be recognition of having wasted years in suffering rather than living. Part of selfhood is coming to have that self-recognition. Now, I'm mindful of a challenge here. Psychoanalysis suggests that most of selfhood is unconscious, much of it, what matters to people. How can we study the unconscious? 
Just as therapists and their patients can themselves only infer unconscious meaning, so also I would suggest many of the social sciences infer meaning from interviews, from ethnography, from surveys, and similarly, psychologists, maybe until the development of the fMRI, infer cognitive capacities and developmental patterns from research studies. Philosophy, as I suggested, infers moral and other forms of reasoning from suppositional problems. The methodologies and epistemology of individuality would have a family resemblance to clinical inference. Moreover, for most of us in the academy, most of you, we're in any field, we're learning about something. Where academically, <clears throat> I'm going to turn, would we locate individuology? The, my answer seems to be clear. Psychoanalysis, as you all know today, is widely studied in the humanities, where it provides a basis for post-structural thinking, film criticism, gender and sexuality. And this series on the self actually comes in a humanities center. Thank goodness, I'm so glad. But my impression is that academic appropriations of psychoanalysis often entail a loss of the central basic psychoanalytic insight that meaning, individuality, and individual selfhood come from within. As is by now clear, my views of individuality and individuality go against the postmodern, poststructural claim that selfhood and identity are fictions or constructions from without, that destabilize fragmented, multi -shi multiply shifting, split psyches without a center are not only our inevitable lot, but perhaps desirable. They don't emerge from the, I don't think that individual, individuality is emerging from cultural discourse. Postmodernism also has drawn support from Freud, who was the original theorist and observer of the decentering and destabilization of individual selfhood but Freud himself was also a practitioner of psychic healing and of psychic wholeness. Moreover, the humanities, and I guess this is something to think about in my not field that isn't going to happen, but in a humanities center, are directed more to the study of texts, theories, ideas, cultural forms, rather than toward the empirical study of people. I was actually reminded of this recently as I was describing this very talk to a young woman sort of about your age who works in my psychoanalytic institute. I think she graduated from college a couple of years ago. She had been a film and literature major and she said she had read psychoanalysis extensively in practically every course she took. And, but until she would gotten her current job, she had never learned or never thought about psychoanalysis as a practice, as a profession, or a place where you could learn about people. Or would people, or would people would, might come to be healed? So you may be puzzled, what about psychology? Freud told us that psychoanalysis should be a general psychology. Personality psychology in the past, I don't know how many, are there psychology people in this room here? Great. Personality psychology did offer ways to study individuals and individual differences. And personology would certainly be important in individuology. In the current period though, and this is again, I'm ranging all over, it's my impression, psychology, which had, was located at one time among the social sciences, has really moved methodologically and theoretically closer to and often redefined itself as a brain and biobehavioral science. Psychology departments vary widely, and I have to say, I, after I'd given my title and written like seven drafts of this talk, I looked at what was in your department. In fact, there's a course on psychoanalysis. Um, there seemed to be an offer of clinical and applied psychology internships for undergraduates, so um, it doesn't apply. But for the most part, we find that affective science has replaced personality, that personality and social psychology have merged, that cognitive and developmental psychology are neurocognitive, and that clinical psychology in most major universities has become clinical science. Psychology constructs control, conducts controlled variable research in which the researcher's personal presence is as far as possible eliminated or made exactly the same for each subject. And none of its subfields focuses on the complexity of individuality and individual subjectivity. Ironically, actually, it's, in, it's within that most objective social science economics 
that we do find underlying assumptions about subjectivity, motivation, and reasoning from within. Rational choice is, in fact, a psychological theory of how people behave from within. Preference structures based on innate goals, cost-benefit analyses, these are all actually hypotheses about innate motivation and innate, innate subjectivity, utility <coughs> maximization. We find the economist Daniel Kahneman, who claims that we're not governed by a rational self, but by an irrational, unconscious part of our brain. So where would we locate individuology? Provisionally, as must be clear, I would place it among the social sciences, along with ethnography, field work, open-ended interviewing, life history, all of these qualitative and intersubjective social sciences. In all of these fields, findings unfold in situ, and the influence of the researcher and the research, research relationship are seen as something to be understood and not to be avoided. They're part of the process. The relationship in all of these fields, in these qualitative social sciences, is important to the finding. Now, if we go back to the original social natural science division, um, the 19th century German distinction, it's between Geisteswissenschaften and Naturwissenschaften, which I can't say either of, but the first, Geisteswissenschaften, is the sciences of mind or spirit, and Naturwissenschaften is of the natural sciences. What happened is that the Geisteswissenschaften came to mean the social sciences, but the original division of human sciences, history, philosophy, and I would suggest individuality, subjectivity, self, it all kind of went by the boards as it became all social. So our standard translation now compares the social to the natural sciences, and that excludes mind and spirit. The, that divide, the geistes Naturwissenschaften divide, also points towards a methodological division that I think is useful for us to think about. Ideographic, individualizing, case-based methodologies and epistemologies single historical cases, single ethnographies, single studies of individuals, rather, or single community studies, rather than towards statistics, generalization, universal laws and processes. It points towards the whole division toward meaning and understanding rather than to cause. And likewise, the study of individuals, selfhood, subjectivity, as I said, would really be based in cases. So I think that this original divide would, ha would find room for a, a, an individuology department. An anthropologist studies a single culture, a qualitative sociologist, this is what all my colleagues did, studied individual institutions or neighborhoods, members of particular professions, ethnic groups, gender groups. They all have a general theory of institutions, professions, race, or gender, but they're studying one instance of it. In the sociology of emotions, the social scientist, as she interviews Arlie Hochschild, is continually mindful of her own personhood and of the impact and the quality of the interaction, which matters to what she finds. So throughout these human social sciences, which is where I would place individuology, subjects study subjects, and matters of intersubjectivity enter in. Psychoanalysis describes a clinical interaction in the same way. I'm wondering, I was going to talk, give a few examples, but I think I'm sort of going way past time. I don't know when, no. what you want. Five, ten minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so. What am I going to do? Oh. I'm going to skip over all the stuff about inferential fields. Um, and uh, maybe I can do yeah. you know, so Maybe, so either I can talk, or I can talk about what some of my, my own teaching was that did some of this. I think that would be a good idea. Um, so anybody can read this if they want, but I really tried to look at what are the problems, where would you locate individuology, how can you do it if you don't know the unconscious, um, how do we infer, and then the fact that we infer in almost every social science. We never... Uh, you know, getting actual truth, and when we are, we're getting um, sort of named, labeled, rated, and quantified um, res responses. Uh, so, um, 
I'm mindful of anything. I don't want to go on. I'm enough of a humanist in spite of all my insistence about being a social scientist that I never use PowerPoint and I never summarize. I always write papers. Um, individuality is not a fee. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk about it. There's a lot about individuality, individual subjectivity, and individual that isn't unconscious and that could be studied. You can read memoir, autobiography, life history, psychohistory, individual case studies, and anthropology. You can interview. Individuality, individuality is not a field, but I can point to some possibilities by describing some of my own teaching, in addition to traditional courses or courses that I made traditional, like feminist theory courses that were, within sociology, somewhat insurgent. And of course, one of the wonderful things about the academy for all of you is that academic freedom. You could teach what you wanted. I taught, and I'm going to give you some examples from a course called Psyche, Culture, and Society, Psychoanalytic Feminism, Individuality and Society, and Classical and Contemporary Psychoanalytic Theory. Psyche, Culture, and Society, Psychoanalytic Theory from Freud through the 1960s. We could look through reading psychoanalysts at the psychosocial edge and the edge of everyday experience. We could study dreams, anxiety, gender, family, aggression and war, culture and memory, childhood and identity. When it's the psyche, you can ground readings in personal reflection. Dreams, for example. Invited to think about recent dreams, students if you think about any of your dreams, you sort of nod dreamily as you think back to the last dream you can remember. <laughs> when, you're, when asked to share with a neighbor, everybody talks with great animation about their last dream. Everyone agrees how confused we can be when we try to reconstruct dreams because they're created in a different state and they often contain contradictory or impossible happenings. Flying is a common example. And for Freud, Dreaming is basic to being an individual self. So you can talk about dreams. You can think about Freud's theory of dreams. You can think about your own dreams. You can tell your dreams to others. You can learn a lot about dreaming. This would be a part of it. This is part of the, an individuology study. Everybody here who talks, if, they, if I stopped and had everybody tell their last dream they remember to the person next to them, you, nobody was going to have the same dream. And we don't have any place in the academy that can try and look at why that's the case or even can look at how dreams are formed. Uh, when it's the psyche, when you're studying individuology, you can ground readings in general and personal reflection. During another week, we study dreams one week, talk about dreams. Another week, we read an, anal an analyst called Winnicott who named something called transitional objects. I don't know if you know about transitional objects. These are the baby's blanket, or the stuffed animal, or the teddy bear. Winnicott says that these are, for the developing child, bridges between me and not me, self and other. Again, how do you become an individual? You start out kind of attached to, not cognitively merged with, mother, other, caretakers, and how do you become a separate person, a separate person in relationship. The teddy bear is created from within. The meaning of it, it's not, you can't give the child any stuffed animal. They have their one animal or they have their one blanket. It's, it's created from within, but it's also presented from without. Winnicott says that this is the place where we negotiate the space between self and other, what comes from within and what goes from without. It helps the baby become a subject in the world related and individuated. And he says quite radically that these transitional <coughs> objects, transitional phenomena, me and not me, expand into culture. So this is a psychoanalytic individuology view of what is culture. For the musician, for instance, an instrument is obviously created. It's made out of wood or metal or brass. And the music that's being played was written by somebody else, but the playing comes from within. The musician feels that this instrument is a part of the self as they play it, and it's part of the self's creativity. And then it's being played maybe in conjunction with another instrumentalist in, say, chamber music or in a, 
a group or some kind of ensemble. Me and not me, the same with painting. An instrument or brush that extends the self, that creates a connection to the other, that creates something out there that's separate. Culture, <coughs> says Winnicott, is a transitional phenomenon. Again, I'm just giving you examples of that realm of individuality that I don't think we learn about. I renamed our sociology department's graduate interviewing methods course, Clinical Listening for Social Scientists. We began from a basic premise, I don't know how many of you have taken interviewing courses, that meaning is emotional as well as cognitive, and that, it, that this is thus a radical ch challenge for all the social sciences. People don't say what they mean. So communication is often tacit and unspoken, unconscious as well as conscious, conveyed through affect. Communication depends on relational context. The interviewer then can't just tape record words and then transcribe the words. The interviewer has to interpret and understand meaning. Otherwise, what you end up with, as you do in all the surveys you read about in the newspaper or in a lot of courses that you take where you do a survey and you write down the answers, you end up with words. You don't end up with meanings. I actually encourage students to pay attention to their own feelings during every interview or in field work, to use the self to understand the other. In clinical parlance, this is called listening to affect and transference and paying attention to countertransference, the feelings of the clinician or the researcher. And finally, I tried to teach, again, the sort of insurgent in sociology, that finding individual variation and individuality is just as worthy a goal as finding commonality and things to generalize about. One student, I'll give you a couple of examples, had interviewed high-tech workers. Their workplace behavior was exactly the same, and at the first, in the first round, he thought he could explain it entirely in terms of the company's incentive system. It made perfect sense. But with a second look, as he did look at his interviews further, he could see that each interviewee had a different underlying motivational system and a different kind of sense of a different confluence of affects and anxieties and fears. One's behavior was entirely explained in terms of wanting to please parents. Another saw himself as a little boy being judged by a mother wife. Another's choices, again, this is all exactly the same behavior, revolved around maintaining a primary identity as a craftsman and as a musician. But the sociological generalization phenomena would have seen them all trying to sort of maximize whatever. Drawing on the concept of countertransference, what the therapist or the researcher brings to the work and consents in herself in reaction to an unconscious communication from the patient or the research subject, another student rethought very difficult patterns of interaction and misunderstandings in her research in the former Soviet Union. She could see that her own self, role, and feelings during particular interviews, her identifications, conflicts, and defenses, all of these shaped how she interaction, interacted, the questions she asked, and how she heard the answers. She could see how and when, looking back through the lens of countertransference, when interviewees became anxious, when they became shut down, when they became defensive, and when they seemed genuinely able to think. And with relief, another student looked back on some work she had done. It was sort of, my department had a lot of kind of Marxist ethnography in it. So she was doing shop floor ethnography in Silicon Valley. She said she had had trouble staying neutral. And as a sociologist, she was supposed to be neutral, not judge, not prefer some workers over others. She said, the problem was I had feelings and a personality. So this is the kind of thing we can't get. In an undergraduate seminar, individuality and society, each student chose one person to study through interviews, biography, memoir, whatever they wanted to do. I wanted, again, to help students to see that you can understand a lot about somebody when you know their race, their, this is sociology, race, ethnicity, family, gender, social, historical location, but however fine-tuned your sociocultural analysis, you can never predict individual subjectivity. People give personal transferential meaning, as I said, to the externals that come from without. By, cla by happenstance, once cla one class had a set of identical twins, and these twins themselves made the point better than any study or any assertion I could have made. 
They came from the same family, the same egg, the same culture, and you still, you could see finally that each of them created and defined their own selfhood from within. Finally, an undergraduate seminar, Psychoanalysis and Feminism. We read a paper that Peggy also referred to, Womanliness as a Masquerade, in which the analyst Joan Riviere says it can never be determined. Is femininity a, ma a masquerade or the real thing? One class member says, that's my life. Several students recognize themselves in a paper called Father Presence and Female Development, which describes how large the father looms in a young girl's development. Freud wrote a paper called A Special Type of Object Choice Made by Men, which was an object of virulent critique of sex as sexist and as objectifying of women by <laughs> feminists of my generation. We hated the paper. Yet now, a Korean-American girl reads the paper and she says with great excitement, Freud's saying exactly how it works in the Korean family. The man wants to have a baby son so he can bring the son home to his mother. That's exactly what a Korean man does. He marries a woman to bring a baby home to his mother. And all the other Asian Americans in the class absolutely agreed. Here was this, this sexist, horrible Freud. <clears throat> All of these courses met, I just have a little bit more. All of these courses met in my proposed individuology department meets. Students sense that there's something missing bet between the abstractness of philosophy and learning about people only through texts in English and other literature fields. Between the social and cultural determinism of the social sciences on the one side and the controlled experiments of psychology on the other. Where can students address the intense wonder and curiosity they feel about people, about themselves? I, at my retirement ceremony at Berkeley, which happened about 10 years ago, um, I wanted to move east and try and work full time as an analyst, so I left academia with a lot of ambivalence. I remarked that if this were the beginning rather than the end of my career, I would like to create a field of individuology. I noticed exactly what I've described here today, that my intellectual focus and passion have always been on the individual in all his or her complexity. Here I've suggested that every university, and every college should have an individuology department and that cur currently psychoanalysis, this is the beginning rather than the end, more than any field describes individuality, the self and the self and selfhood in all their full complexity. Psychoanalysis describes and conceptualizes how individuality, individuality and selfhood develop, how to think about flaws, emptinesses, and difficulties in selfhood. It models for us methodologies for studying individuals and an epistemology for such a study, one that enables individuals at the same time to study and understand themselves from within. I conclude by reminding us this missing field of individuology, this missing study of the self and of our own individuality is deeply what, among other things, interests us and without sufficient attention leads each of us astray. During one year when I took, taught psychoanalysis and feminism, a brilliant undergraduate from an immigrant Chicano family tried to drop the class. Its content made him so uncomfortable. And who wouldn't be uncomfortable the graphicness of two lips speaking together, of psychoanalytic discussions of male and female sexuality, of genital anxiety, of the fluid uncertainty of gender identity. He stuck with it. And later in the semester during an office hour, he, he said to me, do you know that what we're studying in this course is what every one of us thinks about 24-7? <laughs> Indeed, these matters of individuality and self are what each of us thinks about in our lovers, our friends, our parents, our bosses, our professors, and in ourselves 24-7. Why wouldn't we want a field that studies individuals and individuality? And I have to thank Yuval Abnur. Your invitation to come here and talk about the self gave me an opportunity to expand on this fantasy and to share it with all of you. And I really thank you for being here, for listening to this transferentially determined over...
overexcited, overinvested passion that I have. Thank you.